Well, it's Thursday, and this is the Good Old Days of Radio Show with your host, John Tefteller. Thursday means it's time for Weird Creepy Monsters, and we have a Weird Creepy Monster for you today. I'm not going to reveal exactly what that Weird Creepy Monster is. You'll get to re- hear that within the show. Uh, the, the hint, in a way, is in the title. Um, this is an episode of Quiet, Please, my favorite weird and creepy show other than Lights Out, um, <laughs> both written by Willis Cooper. Uh, Lights Out uh, was Arch Obler's, but Willis Cooper and uh, Arch Obler developed Lights Out in Chicago first, and then Willis Cooper went out to Hollywood to write films like The Son of Frankenstein, and Arch Obler stayed in Hollywood and continued on with Lights Out. Willis Cooper came back in 1947, Uh, Actually, he came back a little bit before that to write some Lights Out episodes when Obler went off to do something else. And then he had his own little series called Quiet, Please in 1947 to 1950. And that's what we're going to hear today, an episode of Quiet, Please from June 4th, 1949. The title of the show is Tanglefoot. And I'll let you sit there and guess what that means Uh, But you'll be told fairly soon, and then you'll see if you think Tanglefoot is a monster or not. So here we go. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. American Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Tangle Foot. Back in the old days when GI didn't mean general issue, it just meant galvanized iron. I used to be a plumber. There are no cracks about leaving tools in the shop when you go out on a job. Because if a plumber took along all the tools he's liable to need on a job he don't know nothing about till he gets there, he'd need one of those moving vans to tote them. Just the same, what you can do with a 14-inch Stilson wrench and a mitt full of oakum, you'd be surprised at. This place where I worked, well, you ever smell a plumbing shop? And I tell you what you smell. Oakum, first thing. Like creosote, that's what you start with. Linseed oil, that's in the red lead you use on the joints and stuff. The smell of hot lead where the kids melting down scrap lead into little pigs you can put in your bag. Galvanized iron. Yeah, sure, you can smell galvanized iron. Go past the bins where they keep the L's and the T's and the street L's and the cuptons and the unions. All sizes and 40 teen sizes. You can smell galvanized iron, all right. Yeah, and there's a smell of rats that live back behind the bins. Gasoline burning in the blowtorches and the furnaces. And the thing I remember best of all, the smell of the flypaper. My heavens, there seemed to be flypaper every place. I don't know, maybe in the old days there was more of it or there was more flies or something. Seemed like every place you went, you run into flypaper. Remember that smell? Like... Varnished with sugar in it, like taffy that got spoiled. Kind of a fascinating smell in a sicky way. Think about it, and you'd kind of think, yeah, no wonder the flies liked this smell and went for it. Smell? Sure, flies can smell. They got smellers that'll make a bloodhound jealous if he knows it. And the flies got lots of things. Yeah, you got a jillion eyes, six fancy legs, wings. And a trunk like an elephant. Only little there. The boscus, they call it. Huh? They are not the flies. They can't talk. Boy, how do you they could? I know a lot about flies. I'll tell you about it. I can see it today. There was people living upstairs above the common shop where I worked. That was in the summer of 1915, I guess, or 
Not quite a while ago. Go back porch, hung over the back porch of the shop. Uh, uh, made kind of a shed where we used to thread pipe, melt up scrap lead, stuff like that. And rickets, the horse, he used to be tied up back there in the alley with a wagon. When you was working back there, it was quiet and shady and hot. All you could hear was Ricketts stamping his feet and switching his tail at the flies. and Maybe the whoo of the gasoline furnace. And whoever he was working with talking kind of lazy and slow in the heat. Ah, boy, was it hot. I and Herbie, we was threading three-quarter-inch black iron pipe. You want for boat excursion tonight, Buck? Yeah, what boat excursion? Crawfish club. On the Percy Swing tonight. Well, I thought it was tomorrow. No, tonight. Yeah, that's good enough. Get another length of pipe. Hot, ain't it? Any one of our results in the shade. It's hot for old Ricketts out there in the sun. His head's in the shade. What's he hollering about? Flies, I guess. You should put the fly netting on him. Yeah. Look out, don't step in the flypaper. Yeah, flypaper every place. That Bert Kincaid, he's nuts about flypaper. Don't go on stuff. Get it all over the place. Well, that's where you're throwing it. You thread up the pipe. I'll take care of the flypaper. You think with all that stuff around, there wouldn't be so many flies? Flies are smart. How do you mean, smart? I love flypaper. Flypaper's always full of them. And them's the dumb flies. Smart ones look at it and smell it and fly away. Land on people, horses. Take a bite. We'll have longer. I wonder how long flies live. Nah, I don't know. Too long. Any more length of pipe we ain't threaded? Mm-hmm. Here. I wonder what flies think about. Eating. That's what I'm thinking about. What time is it? Look at that fancy new wristwatch of yours. Busted. Must be pretty near noon. Gonna go home, do you? you Wanna go with me? I wasn't here. <laughs> Heck, you wasn't. Well, <laughs> no flies on you, but. Well, uh, Mom made some ice cream she left for me. Your mom home? No, she went up to Peoria this morning. P.A. Bergner has got a sale or something. If I could stop at Ruins and get some boiled ham or something, we could make sandwiches. Oh, we got some. Oh, if you got something there, we'll eat them off you. Yeah. Let's have a clock. Let's go. Do you ever hear anything start so simple and easy and not meaning nothing? Does that mean anything? <laughs> yeah, you'll get it in a minute. You'll get a lot of stuff you don't expect. It all started that way, though, with bread and pipe and kicking fly paper around and, and stuff. We had up the ice cream at Herbie's house, sitting in the kitchen, where it was kind of cool. And gosh, I hated to go back to work. <clears throat> I hate to go back to, but. I'd like to lay down and take a nap or, or something. Yeah, Bert and Katie, can you? Yeah. Wish that was a fly. Yeah. Go bite Bert Kincaid. Ah, oh, that's all right. The only thing that's wrong with him is he's a boss. Flies don't have bosses. Yeah. Want some more ice cream? Yeah, he sent for your mom. Oh, she don't like ice cream. Don't you want some more? No, I'm full. <clears throat> Thanks. We can set a couple minutes more. It's only 20 to 1. Yeah. No, I'm thinking about flies. Are you crazy about flies today? I just got to thinking about it. Hey, what became of your dog? Oh, he's out in the backyard. Gets hot. Likes to get under the coal shed. Keep cool. Might be under there myself. Wish I had a pet fly. You're crazy. Got a pet fly passing the rope on him, leading him around. Many little bitsy rope you'd have to have. Now, this would be a great big fly. Big as a dog. What kind of a dog? 
I like that old collar of Masterson's. When I fly that big bite, you'd be ruined. I'm looking at a fly with a magnifying glass the other day. Yeah. I seen one once. Got the meanest looking faces I ever seen. Great big eyes. Jillian eyes. Look at you from all over. Always washing their faces like a cat. They carry germs. Oh, sure. Germs, though. Gee. That well, big fight should be something. She'll be a swell pet, though. If you could tame him. Oh, I'd tame him all right. Maybe the fly tamer. Be as big and strong as a bull. Have to put a big chain on him. And fly away with you. Maybe I could train him to take me places. Fly, you know. <laughs> yeah, you should think of the educated fly. Flies are smart. Fly paper catches and good old tangle foot boy. You have to have an awful big piece of tangle foot to catch this old boy. Ain't that much tangle foot in the world. There ain't no fly like that in the world either. <laughs> oh, boy, if there was. Didn't you hear the whistle? Come on, quarter to one. Yeah. Wonder what you'd feed a fly that big. Have to feed them people, I guess. Come on, let's go. I remember it was pretty near three, four months later. It was just getting kind of the first days of fall, and people were starting to burn dry leaves along the curbstone. Herbie and me was fixing a hot water heater for Frank and Edith Gibbons, the telegraph operator. Live out there where Washington runs into Court Street. Kind of cool that day, I remember. Mrs. Gibbons, she was jawing at us because she said we were so slow. She wanted that hot water heater fixed right this minute. She wanted to take a bath before the chicken pie supper at the Christian Church. She had to put the icing yet on two devil's food cakes, and would we please hurry up? She was all of a tizzy. Well, finally, Henry come with a reducer tea we was waiting for. Mrs. Gibbon, she went out to the kitchen to look at the cakes, and don't go banging things around and make my cakes fall, she said. I said, yes, ma'am, for about the 14th time, and she shut the door. I laid down my ball peen hammer, and I said, phew. Me too. I can't women leave you alone. I get the union after her. She thinks she knows so much about plumbing. Well, at least it's cool. What's the matter? Yeah, I got my elbow on the flypaper. My heavens, what she still got flypaper around for? Yeah, let me do it. Oh, got to take off the skin, too. Yeah, squirt me some gasoline on it. I got guck all over me. Ain't been any flies for three weeks. Or... Yeah, more gasoline. I know where there's a fly. Huh? I know where there's a fly. Well, why don't you swat them? Well... Two reasons. First, I uh, kind of like this fly. Like him? Raised him from a pup. Herbie. Hmm? Raised a fly from a pup? Second thing is, you want to swat this fly, you better have a baseball bat. What? This here fly is eight inches long. Huh? Hand me the red lead. How big? Maybe nine. Where are you going? Miss Gibbons. What are you calling her for? Miss Gibbons, call up the asylum. Herbie Butterworth is seeing flies nine inches long. Here, under the coal shed. Come on, Teddy. Here, Teddy boy. Here, Teddy. Come on, Teddy. Come on out there, boy. Darn you, Teddy. Come on, Teddy. Here, boy. Good dog. Come on, Ted. Ted, you hear me? Come on out of there. Come on now. dog. Ted, come on, boy. Teddy. He's asleep, maybe. What, with me hollering that way? Well, maybe he ain't there. Maybe he's up. Yes, too, I can see him. He's laying down in there. Here, Teddy. Here, Teddy. Well, reach in and pull him out. Come on, dog, come on. What? Huh? Dead. You ain't ever seen anybody, anything I mean, that a, that a fly kills. No, I don't mean kill by putting germs on them or like that. I mean, 
so murdered by a fly. This here fly is eight inches long. Maybe nine. This here fly killed Teddy that was Herbie Butterworth's dog that was a hound dog that weighed 42 pounds on John Aper's scales the day before. This here fly, he just up and killed poor old Teddy. But maybe Teddy was scared to death by the fly first. Because nobody in the whole great big wide world ever seen a fly that was eight, nine inches long. Nobody but first Herbie and then Teddy. And afterwards... Me. I ain't found him yet. Maybe he got froze to death. Kind of scares me, Buck. Don't it you? Here he comes after me. I'll bat him on the head. He'll come flying up to you. Come flying up. You won't even see his wings. You know how flies' wings is. You can see through them. Maybe he's froze to death. Flies can't stand cold weather. They die. They don't always die. Sometimes they go into, what is it, a comma? When they get warm, they come to again. And then they're hungry. Well, I think he's dead. Because we ain't heard about anybody croaking, you know, with a, with a mystery. Not since Teddy... Teddy, I can still see that dog. Try not thinking about Teddy. Maybe you ought to leave some flypaper around. Big hunks of flypaper. I got flypaper all around the coal bin there where he was. Heavy enough? It don't have to be so heavy. He lands in a hunk of tangle footed. It'll get all stuck to the hair and hair. Hair on his legs. Flies got hair on their legs. Real hair? More like bristles, like spikes, kind of. He get flypaper stuck in his legs, his wings. He ain't gonna go skittering around much. Maybe he's dead. Sure hope not. Hope not? Well, I, I kind of liked him. Till he ate up Teddy. I'd be just as satisfied to find if I get to see him. Yeah, it must be quite a sight, though. Like looking at a fly through a magnifying glass. Sure glad he only got to be eight, nine inches long. Oh, I hate to lose him. I could put him in a circus or, or a sideshow or something. Make a jillion dollars. Take him up to Chicago. People would come from miles or miles around. Yeah, to a zoo just about. Or a museum like that one. Where is it? New York? Yeah, he was quite a thing. He used to eat mice. I went and caught mice and, and let him have them. Ought to see what he'd do to a dead mouse. Oh, thank you kindly. i seen what he'd done to Teddy. How'd you get him so big, Herbie? Huh? Secret, Buck. That's so? I bet if he'd lay an egg. The egg would be bigger. I mean, the pup would be bigger than he was. Fly egg. Bigger than a hen's egg it'd be. Bigger than maybe a turkey egg. Maybe he's dead. Yeah. Hey, he comes after me, I'm going to shoot him. My old 12 Oh, you couldn't hit a balloon with a bull fiddle. You hit him all right. Hello, Louise. How do you do? Who's that, Buck? I don't know. Just moved to town from someplace in Ohio, Iowa, someplace. Louise. Louise McGinty, McKinley, McKinney, something like that. Where'd you know her? Met her at Empire Hall, that dance the other night. What dance? Social Athletic Club? Uh Uh-huh. Well, night. See you at the shop in the morning. So long. It's cold, ain't it? Yeah, gonna snow. Feels like snow. More busted water pipes. Yeah. Well, so long, Buck. Say that, uh, that Louise, what's your name? That's something, ain't it? Yeah, I feel like that there type. I like it. Say, uh, Herbie. What? Listen. What? Listen, that... That great big fly of yours. Yeah? On the level now. Is there a great big fly? Huh? Couldn't you just be... Well, I just thought about it all of a sudden. i never seen this here fly. You mean you think I'm just fooling? I was wondering. I was just making it up. Was you? No. I wasn't making it up. I just wondered. Listen, Buck. I never made that up. Listen, I wished I was. I wish I'd never started making flies grow big. 
I ought to have stopped when I got one this big. I wish... Well, I don't know whether to believe you or not. Listen, Buck, when I think with that there flag... You remember way back last summer when we first talked about it? You said, what would you feed, a great big fly? Yeah. Remember what you said? What? You said people. People, you said. That's what you'd feed them. Oh. Oh, yeah. Listen, Buck, he already had a dog. That we know about. What if he... If he ain't dead by now and all is cold, he must be... He must be what? Hungry. Third of December, 1915. Yeah, seven, six, five, four, three, the third, the night Herbie and me talked, like I told you. I remember because on the seventh, the Boy Scouts had a movie at the Capitol Theater. It used to be the Standard Theater. And there was a kid with a bugle blowing it out front. That was the seventh. That was the night Bert Kincaid phoned me up from the shop and Mayor Watson came over from kind of next door and told me Bert was calling me. And I were over, Bert, uh, he said, you and Herbie Butterworth go right away to these people, these McKinleys or McKinneys or McKinneys, whichever it was, because their friend or something was wrong with it and they was holler and they was freezing. And I should go right on over and Herbie would meet me there. He was already on the way with the rickets and the wagon and the tools. So I said, all right, and I went home and put on my overshoes and my army sweater. And I'm over there. See, the place is only two doors away from where Herbie lived, there by the Garfield School. And that's why he was there already, see? I never even bothered to knock on the door. I just went around to the cellar door with my Coleman lantern and I come on down and Herbie was there already sitting on the cellar steps so I just about fell over him. And not looking very happy. Say, I said, I thought there was freezing to death here in this house with a busted furnace that's not cold down here. It's warm, I said. I fixed it. Huh? I fixed the furnace. This valve was corroded and I put a new one on. I fired up, it's all right. Well, what you sitting on the cellar stairs for then if it's all fixed? What you sitting around here for? Well, I... Why are you looking so crabby about it? Anybody ought to be crabby, it's me. I walked halfway across town. I'm about... What you so crabby about? Shh, shh. Huh? She's down here. Who? Louise, you know, the McKinley gal or whatever her name is. Where? <laughs> oh. That's why I ain't welcome to his company. Three Shut right up. <laughs> Gonna make some time, huh? Shut up. She'll hear you. Where is she? I went back there in the preserve closet. What for? Going to bring you a jar of apple butter? The old man makes elderberry wine. <laughs> Got some bottles back there he brought from Ohio or Iowa or whatever it is. Three years old. I sure like elderberry wine. I know it. Well, I tell you, Herbie, I'm a good guy. I'm your friend, Herbie. See, when you got everything fixed up, I'll beat it. You don't have to go. I never stood in the guy's way, Herbie. I'll go out into the cold and the snow. Ain't no I'll snow. I'll go right home and read B.C. Allensworth's editorials in the Times, and I'll leave the coast clear for you. You don't have to do that, Buck. Just as soon as I have one drink of elderberry wine. Huh. No, there was a catch in it. Uh, now I'll go right away, honest, Herbie. <laughs> hey. You've been telling her about giant flies and things. Cut it out. That thing's dead. I guess if it ever was alive. You got the makings? I got some tailor-mades. Knee bows? Yeah, much obliged. <sighs> Ain't you smoking? Nah. Well, what's she doing, making that wine? Oh, well, man probably hit it for herself. You give her a good smacking if you find she's smoking. <laughs> Probably give you a good smacking, too, huh? Why don't you yell at her? The folks will hear upstairs. Louise! Shut up. <laughs> hey, Louise! Shut up, Buck. Come on, let's go help her. Nix. Louise, you want some help? Buck, the people will hear you. In here? Hey, Louise. I thought maybe you needed some... Louise! Louise! Buck, what's that? Herbie. What's the matter, Buck? Buck, what's that? Louise! <laughs> Man, 
I could recognize her by her clothes. By her clothes, that's all. You never saw a person that met a fly? No, you never did. Herbie and I did. A big, not eight, nine inches long now, down in the hot, stuffy cellar. Two feet long. And fat and kind of loggy it was, dopey, like after you had a big dinner. And Louise, Herbie, he fainted, and I... Back there by the furnace pipes. I could see them eyes. A jillion eyes. And that trunk like elephant. The kind of buzz and wiggled its eyes at me and rubbed its face with its... And paused like a cat washing its face after dinner. And I tried to holler, but all I could hear was this buzzing, that's all. And then it kind of stumbled out from the pipes and it jumped and it came right past my face and it, it flew kind of sagging, kind of... Out of the corner of my eye, I seen it. It flew right out into the furnace room, and the furnace door was open, and the fire... You don't want to hear anymore, huh? Well, there's only a little bit more. You've come this far with me, so... Well, they put us both, Herbie and me, in jail. They said we murdered Louise, but nobody could murder anybody like that. And there wasn't any other evidence, so... See, the fly was dead, disappeared, and there wasn't anything to go on. So they had to let us go. That's pretty near the whole story. Ain't it, Herbie? The egg? Oh, sure, I pretty near forgot about that egg. And about the egg. Bigger than a hen's egg. Big's a turkey egg. Back there in the dark behind the pipes. I didn't see it. Duck seen it. But I never told anybody about it. Did I, Herbie? Nobody but you. And when they left us out of jail, we we come back here looking for it, but it was gone. There was kind of a scrunching back there, and we looked, and sure enough... Larva. They call it in the books. You know. And we took it away with us, and sure enough... This one grew bigger than its father, or its mother, or whatever it was. And every one since then has got a little bigger and a little hungrier. Ain't that so, Herbie? Yep. Hungry all the time. Never let him out to hunt. Wait. Look at him. Ain't he a dinger? <laughs> First real live pet fly you ever seen. <laughs> Here, Louise. We call him Louise. Look at them eyes. Jillions of them. <laughs> Look. He unrolls his truck. Ain't that cute? <laughs> Nice, clean face. See the sharp bristles on his legs? Biggest fly in the world. Bigger than a collie. Bigger than a Shetland pony, I bet. And hungrier, too. Come on, Louise. Wake up. He's awake, Buck. Uh-huh. Okay, Herbie? Okay. Go on in. No, you I'm talking to. You, he says. Go on in. Go on in. Louise is hungry. <laughs> That's it. What's the matter? Can't move your feet? Sure. You stuck in something? <laughs> used to call that stuff flight paper. We got a different name for it now. Yeah, no use trying to get loose. You're stuck for good. And Louise is hungry. Only heard a minute, that's all. Careful, Louise, honey. Don't get your feet stuck in the man paper. story is Tango Foot. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper, and the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And my friend Kirby was played by Jack Lascouli. As usual, music for Quiet Please is by Albert Berman, and the sound by William 
J. McClintock. Now for a word about next week's quiet, please. Here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Okay, Bill? Thank you for listening to Quiet, please. We've got a story for you next week. A strange title of The Hat and the Bed and John J. Catherine. The Hat and the Bed and John J. Catherine. Next week. So till next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chapel. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Okay, those of you who have an aversion to flies, maggots, all kinds of creepy, crawly things related to flies, you probably want to shoot me right about now. Um, (laughs) The fly ate the girlfriend, and then the police came, and then there's bigger bigger flies and larvies and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Whatever else. Okay, that's the warped mind of Willis Cooper, but great, great writer for radio. And this was certainly a wonderful episode of Quiet, Please, Tanglefoot, June 4th, 1949. Okay, that's our top 10, one of our top 10 monsters for now. We'll be back next Thursday with another one and back next Tuesday with drama, variety, and comedy. So keep listening to the Good Old Days of Radio show. Make a comment on Facebook. Go to Good Old Days of Radio on Facebook. Just keep telling everybody to listen, and we'll have more and more good shows for you as this continues to roll along. So see you next week, and thank you so much. (laughs) 